afternoon. Uh, the first item of business is portfolio questions. Once I get my <laughs> once I get myself organised, as you are. And the first question is Andy Whiteman, please, Mr. Whiteman. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what consultation is taking place regarding providing local authorities with the power to introduce a tourist tax. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as announced by the First Minister on the 1st of October, we're taking forward an inclusive and transparent national discussion around issues related to tourism tax, working in collaboration with local government partners and the tourism industry to support an informed discussion. We're taking forward roundtable discussions in the coming weeks and we'll make the evidence gathered through this available in due course. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answers. Could he tell us when he expects those discussions to conclude? And can I also confirm that the question at the heart of this debate is actually two distinct questions, which are first, whether should councils should have the, this fiscal power, and second, if they should use any such power, in what circumstances and what rates should be set, etc. Does he accept that the first question is properly a matter for this legislature, but the second is properly for local authorities to determine as they see fit? Cabinet Secretary. I think the second part of the question is a bit premature because, of course, it relates to the outcome of the first part of the question, which is the issue in principle. I think it's important that we take forward that uh, discussion over the course of the next few weeks. I'm very happy to be helpful to the member to write to Andy Whiteman uh, with the engagement programme that we have established. Mundo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, while Scottish tourism is doing well, Scotland is still seen as a high cost destination in some quarters relative to uh, other countries. The Scottish tourism sector therefore raised a great deal of concern about the likely impact of a tourist tax in raising costs still further. As part of the work the Scottish Government are doing, please will, question, doing, please will question. they be doing an economic assessment as to the impact of a tourist tax? Derek Mackay. Uh, well, first of all, the, I think the answer to the question is yes, we'll, we'll do as much analysis as we possibly can so we can have an informed uh, discussion and engagement in that regard. So I think it's right to look at all the evidence. I think that's why it's important to engage with local authorities as well as the hospitality sector, yes, to hear their concerns because they have a contrary view uh, to those uh, uh, within local government in relation to this proposition that's come from uh, local government. Um, we are facilitating mm. that uh, national discussion. I understand the point that Murdo Fraser is making around the costs for the hospitality sector. Uh, one of those costs, of course, is VAT, uh, being higher than most other parts of Europe in relation to hospitality. And that, of course, is a matter for UK government, but in our gift are the non-domestic rates. And that's why Kate Forbes' announcement on the ongoing transitional relief for hospitality was so well received and an important intervention from the Scottish Government. Question two, Bill Bowman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on taxpayers in Scotland retaining as much of their income as those in the rest of the UK in light of the proposals in the UK budget. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has consistently taken decisions to ensure that the Scottish income tax is progressive and raises the revenue required to support our vital public services and indeed the Scottish economy. We've ensured that Scotland has the fairest income tax system in the UK and will take income tax policy decisions on the basis of work, what works best for Scottish taxpayers, Scottish public services and the Scottish economy and we'll set out the details of our tax plans for 2019-20 in the forthcoming budget on the 12th of December 2018. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you for that answer. As was reported in the press last week, head teachers have warned the Scottish Government that a looming tax gap will further cripple the education system by making it hard to recruit school leaders. And they raised this directly with the Cabinet Secretary John Swinney last week. There's been a shortage of applicants already due to a decline in salaries, a rising workload and stress. When combined with the increase in higher tax thresholds we see south of the border but do not benefit from in Scotland, is it any wonder that they struggle to fill these roles? Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what fiscal action he will be taking to help solve this shortage of head teachers in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I will propose to invest in schools, invest in education and hopefully arrive at a satisfactory pay deal for teachers uh, as well. And to achieve those kind of outcomes we have to write uh, decisions on and revenue raising also. So we'll take a fair and balanced approach. I think the teaching profession should be an attractive one to bring people of quality and talent into the profession. And I actually think that teachers would far prefer uh, quality uh, rather than a race to the bottom on tax cuts. I would refer the member to what uh, Larry 
Flanagan said, of course, from the EIS union, that there should be uh, fair taxation, fair and progressive taxation. Of course, that contributes to the resources that we would have available for education. Kenny Gibson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what the impact of the Chancellor's decision to increase national insurance contributions will be on low- and middle-income earners? And is he concerned that at least some MPs who represent Scottish constituencies are classed as English taxpayers, depriving Scotland of around £20,000 in income tax revenue per MP, and does agree that all such MPs should register as Scottish domiciled taxpayers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I'll come to that second matter after I make the substantial point which is uh, that the Chancellor did indeed sneak in the next uh, change under the radar last week with no mention of it in his budget speech. In contrast, the Scottish Government will take policy decisions on the basis of what works best for Scottish taxpayers, Scottish public services and the Scottish economy. And whatever choices we make, we will be clear and transparent, unlike the UK Government. Given the link between income tax and national insurance contributions, we believe that decisions on both should be taken by this Parliament with the interests of Scotland in mind. And for that to happen, the powers over national insurance contributions should be in Scotland's hands, not Westminster's. As to the tax affairs and other interests of members of the House of Commons, I'm sure Kenny Gibson will be all over that and will give me the necessary information I require to take that forward. James Kelly. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that under the Scottish Government's current taxation scheme, it's unfair that a principal speech and language therapist earning £45,000 pays the same rate of tax as the managing director of Scottish Enterprise earning £135,000. And will he bring forward proposals in his draft budget to ensure that top rate earners like senior management at Scottish Enterprise pay a fairer rate of tax and make a contribution to funding public services? Cabinet Secretary. I'll bring forward a, a fair proportionate balanced budget that is uh, in, in relation to tax progressive as well. I've set out the principles that we'll follow in that regard. I do genuinely look forward to the proposition that may come from the Labour Party in relation to income tax, whether it's the, the UK Labour Party, the Scottish Labour Party, or the future branch of the Scottish Labour Party, whatever it happens to be. I look forward to that coherent alternative budget but what I'll bring forward is, will be a competent, balanced budget. In relation to the top rate of tax, we've had this debate a number of times. My objective is to raise tax in a responsible and proportionate way. If I had followed Labour's advice on the top rate of tax, I would have generated less money for Scotland's public services. What would the point in that be? Therefore, I will take a, an evidence-based approach to income tax. Thank you. Question three, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when air passenger duty will be fully devolved. Minister. As the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work informed Parliament on the 1st of June 2018, the introduction of air departure tax will be deferred beyond April 2019. The Scottish Government has been clear that a resolution to the Highlands and Islands exemption issue has to be found before ADT can be introduced in Scotland. We cannot simply continue the current APD provision when there is an unresolved issue of EU law. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that answer. And will the Minister commit to fulfilling her manifesto pledge at reducing air passenger duty when it is devolved by 50% by the end of this Parliament? Minister. Well, we remain committed to it reducing air departure tax um, and we want to abolish it altogether when resources allow. But we will set out our plans on tax rates and bans once a solution to the Highlands and Islands exemption has been found. That is of paramount significance. And the member might want to note that it is to, up to the UK government, um, who is the member state, to notify the EU on this issue. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Would it not be sensible to use this extra time that the delay has given us to go back to square one with the government's policy, do the proper research that's been lacking in the past so that we're no longer relying on the spurious debunked figures the government has used previously and that we arrive at a policy that will reduce carbon emissions from aviation instead of increasing them? Minister. Well, as the member will know that our climate change, change plan accommodates projected changes in aviation emissions and the Committee on Climate Change advised in September 2017 that such an increase is likely to be manageable. But as I said to the previous member, we will set out our plans uh, once a solution to the Highlands and Islands exemption has been found and that will be informed by the independent reports that we have commissioned, consultation and ongoing stakeholder engagement. Question four, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government 
how much of its budget it has allocated to city deals. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, cities and their regions are the engines of our economy. The Scottish Government is committed to working with all our cities to unlock investment, whether that's individually or collectively, and whether that's through a city-region deal, one of the Scottish Government's devolved initiatives to stimulate growth and deliver infrastructure investment or a combination of these measures. The Scottish Government has consistently supported deals for all of Scotland's cities, indeed all of Scotland coverage, and is a full partner in all of the city region deals agreed in Scotland. Considering the events of yesterday, I'm continuing to look at the resources for city deals in year, but of course details for the forthcoming financial year 2019-20 will be updated in due course once the final budget has been determined. Ruth McGuire. Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In the UK Government's budget last week, there was only a passing reference to the Ayrshire growth deal with a commitment to progress. Frankly, it's not good enough. Can the Cabinet Secretary reaffirm that this Scottish Government sees the Ayrshire growth deal as a priority and is committed and fully focused on investing in a full go growth deal for Ayrshire that brings benefit to the whole region? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I can. Absolutely. I agree with Ruth Maguire. The Scottish Government remains committed to securing a growth deal for Ayrshire. The Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity discussed the Ayrshire growth deal with the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, when they met last month and he made clear the Scottish Government's intention to achieve a head of terms agreement clearly outlining the commitments of both governments to the deal as soon as possible. I understand I'll be meeting the as Secretary of State this afternoon, I will raise the issue again with them, as well as, of course, the Tayside Cities deal, where the UK Government should also step up to the plate and deliver more support for that region. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask about the proposed islands deal? Uh, when will this deal be in place, and will it take account of the additional costs of providing goods and services in our island communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson leads on city deals, notwithstanding the remarks uh, I've just made. The progress on the islands deal will be contingent upon agreement again with UK Government and the island authorities themselves. We will work in partnership uh, with those stakeholders and those partners. Of course, we want to take it forward as quickly as possible, but we're also in the hands of others in terms of the ask that's made of that collective partnership. But I'd like to leave the, the, the Chamber very clear that we're keen to get on with that particular growth deal. Question five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government if it will pass on any health consequentials received to its budget to Scotland's NHS. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government will continue to deliver its commitment uh, that all health resource consequentials will be passed on in full to the health portfolio budget. Every penny of health resource consequentials arising from the UK autumn budget will be passed on uh, to the Scottish Government's health budget. Richard Lyle. We know that the Tories' promised uplift for Scotland's NHS already has been cut by 50 million, with a cumulative impact of over a quarter of a billion being held with health from Scotland's health service over the next five years. If their budget, in their budget, the UK government failed to set out that further consequentials in years to come wouldn't be cut further, leaving open the risk of further cuts. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out if he has any confirmation from the UK government? that this won't be the case. Cabinet Secretary. I regret that no such confirmation has been given. And to add to this uncertainty, the Chancellor of the Exchequer raised the prospect of a new budget in the event of a no-deal Brexit. As the Health Secretary highlighted last week, this increases the significant uncertainty that is faced by our NHS staff, on top of the uncertainty among the very valuable members of our healthcare workforce, who are European Union nationals. I continue to urge the UK Government to provide the level of clarity which I now have been requesting since June this year. Uh, question six, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken to help boost the Ayrshire economy. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government and its agencies are taking a wide range of actions to help boost the Ayrshire economy. Central to our ambitions for Ayrshire is an agreement of a growth deal. We'll continue to work with the regional partners on their investment proposals and hope to be able to announce a heads of terms agreement as soon as possible following the conclusion of negotiations with the UK Government that I've referenced earlier. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. When does he anticipate that the UK Tory Government will finally sign off on the Oyster Growth Deal they have dragged their feet on for the last two years? How much does the Scottish Government expect the UK Government will contribute? And will inclusive growth be delivered across Ayrshire given that uh, there are concerns to date the North Ayrshire Council has not included the Gallic Valley in its own proposals. Cabinet Secretary. Well, unfortunately, the Scottish Government cannot control the pace at which the UK Government makes decisions. You see what 
somewhat uh, preoccupied uh, at the moment. But let me be clear, the Scottish Government is ready to move forward towards signing a heads of terms agreement with the Ayrshire Growth Deal as soon as possible. Local partners, as Kenny Gibson has said, want fresh and transformative investment in the Ayrshire economy, and so does the Scottish Government. Question seven, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how productivity and the economy can be supported through innovations and technology. Minister. Uh, we are working to ensure that innovation and technology drive sustainable economic growth and as positive outcomes for Scotland's people, I set in our recent economic action plan. The plan covers key enabling technologies where Scotland has strengths, such as quantum, digital and automation, to ensure Scotland's industrial base is equipped to embrace new technologies through investments such as the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland and the Medicines Manufacturing and Innovation Centre. By investing in these emerging technologies, Scotland will create new high-value jobs with increased productivity. Claire Adams. Thank the Minister for that answer. He will be aware of areas where Scotland is leading in innovation and technology, such as the Hutton Institute, vertical farming. Um, is this not just to important for Scotland's future economy, but also has the potential to tackle food so shortages and work towards achieving UN global sustainable development goals? Minister. Indeed, world-leading projects such as the vertical farming demonstration building <laughs> at the James Hutton Institute do indeed have the potential to contribute to global challenges such as food security. My colleague, the Deputy First Minister, was pleased to officially open the facility in August. The demonstrator developed by Intelligent Growth Solutions Limited is arguably the world's most technically advanced indoor farm. It will assist the research and development of new crop varieties and technologies suited to vertical growth systems. Supporting innovations in the bioeconomy and addressing environmental and food security concerns for industrial biotechnology, agri-tech and animal health are opportunities highlighted in our life sciences strategy. Question 8, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports small and medium-sized enterprises to contribute to the green economy. Minister. Through our Resource Efficient Scotland programme, the Scottish Government offers a full package of support to small and medium-sized enterprises. This helps them to implement energy, resource and water efficiency measures that cut their carbon emissions and running costs. We also help businesses to understand the opportunities available to them in the green economy supply chain through the Energy Saving Trust. We help businesses to participate in the supply chain for energy efficiency and microgeneration by providing training, capacity building and networking events. Linda Fabiani. I thank the Minister for that answer and would ask um, whether he recognises that former new towns in Scotland, such as East Kilbride, are well placed to contribute to the green economy. They have many small and medium enterprises at the heart of innovation in this field. And could I also ask the Minister to visit EK with me to meet and learn from many such relevant businesses and hear from them how they can contribute to Scotland's green aspirations. Minister. Well, uh, let me, as uh, equally as a representative of a, a new town, concur entirely with Ms Fabiani's point. I believe our new towns, such as East Kilbride, Cumbernauld, and Ms Maguire's here, so I better mention Irvine uh, as well, are very well placed uh, to benefit by the measures we put in place. And also, we think of the green economy, as we rightly should, in terms of uh, the uh, measures we're taking around energy efficiency and climate change, but also we should think of it in terms of natural capital, the new towns have a, a lot of green space in them as well, so they're very well placed uh, in that regard. And uh, yes, I'd be very happy to visit East Cobride with Ms Fabiani. Question nine, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much its budget is, uh, for social security is spent on mitigating the UK government welfare reforms. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we expect to spend over £125 million in 2018-19 on welfare mitigation and measures to help protect those on low incomes. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply? The C Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Chancellor made the bold statement that the austerity is coming to an end. Given the fact that analysis from the Resolution Foundation shows that over three quarters of the Tories planned 12 billion of welfare cuts, remaining government policy, and the budget failed to halt the rollout of the universal credit or the end of the hated two-child two cap. Can he confirm that this is not the case and does he foresee the Scottish Government having to continue to set aside money to correct the worst aspects of these cuts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly the UK Government budget 
did not single, uh, signal the end of austerity. The cuts to welfare will still be felt despite the announcements that the Prime Minister had previously made. They could have made a different choice. They're holding £15.4 billion in reserve. As a Chancellor describes it, his post-Brexit deal firepower. Uh, I would have suggested that they put that resource into protecting public services, uh, stimulating the economy and protecting the most vulnerable in our society. I've mentioned the figure of £125 million in the current financial year around welfare mitigation. This includes spending to mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax, helping over 70,000 households in Scotland keep a roof over their heads and sustain their tenancies, and the Scottish Welfare Fund, which is a vital lifeline for people across Scotland. But there is only so much this Parliament can do to protect the people of Scotland from a right-wing pernicious Tory government and that's why we need more powers around welfare to fully protect the people of Scotland from the ravages of a right-wing government led by Theresa May. Question 10, John Scott. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has conducted regarding a timescale for reducing the large business supplement. Minister. We want to ensure that Scotland is the best place to do business in the UK and all non-domestic rates decisions are made in light of that and also of the budgetary context which reflects the budget allocations from the UK government. The Barclay Review recommended that the large business supplement be reduced to 1.3 pence in 2020-2021 to bring it in line with the English rate and sooner if it becomes affordable to do so. We committed to reviewing the LBS at each future budget in light of affordability. John Scott. I thank the Minister for her answer. And as she said, the Barclay Review recommended that the business supplement, the large business supplement, be reduced by 2021. And this would significantly help the economy in air constituency. And it would help the Scottish economy by £62 million. Pounds. Can the Scottish Government give a time scale for implementing this reduction? I'd be grateful if that could happen. Minister. Well, we, any announcement on non-domestic rates will obviously be set out in the Scottish Budget in December, but we have focused on supporting small businesses and ensuring that Scotland is a competitive place to do business. We've already um, taken forward some of the Barclay recommend recommendations and established measures that are unique in the UK, such as the Growth Accelerator, which applies to large and small business to ensure that Scotland is a competitive place to do business. Question 11, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what impact assessment is undertaken of the long-term effect on the economy of stockpiling goods and commodities. Minister. The latest Scottish Government State of the Economy report sets out analysis on the impact of businesses stockpiling in advance of the UK leaving the EU in March 2019. The analysis shows that overall between 2018-19 in 2021-22, this activity has a negative impact on Scottish GDP growth of around 0.2 percentage points. The fact that businesses are having to consider stockpiling underlines the uncertainty that Brexit is placing on our economy. We will continue to argue that the only deal that will deliver for Scotland is to remain in the single market and in the customs union. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to the Minister for his reply. The British Retail Consortium, with a weather eye on Brexit, has condemned the idea of stockpiling, saying it's not practical for two reasons. They don't have to spare capacity and it's impractical to store fresh produce. Does the Minister agree? Minister. I think the key point here is the uncertainty that's caused by the UK government's actions around about Brexit. I'm sure there will be situations where um, stockpiling is required to ensure that uh, essential supplies are in place to deal with uncertainty. But I do agree with the member's general point that in general it's not, uh, it's not good for the economy to stockpile excessively <coughs> and it's not good for, for ind individual businesses to do so either. Question 12, Mary Fee. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the UK budget will affect Scotland's equalities budget. Cabinet Secretary. Following the UK budget, the Scottish Government's resource block grant from the UK Government, the money that we're able to invest in day-to-day -day public services, remains almost £2 billion lower in real terms next year compared with 2010-11. For 2018-19, we increased our budget for specific equality activities by 12% to £22.7 million. This supports work to prevent discrimination, promote human rights and build more cohesive communities. Decisions on the budget allocation for equalities related activity for the next year will be taken as part of the process to develop the Scottish budget, which will be presented to Parliament on the 12th of December. Mary Fee. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. This Parliament is a, a human rights guarantor and as such should be a bulwark against regressive, austerity-driven economic policies. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what direct act action he'll take to ensure a holistic approach is taken to equalities with focused joint work across portfolios to ensure the best outcomes for equality spend? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a really important uh, question and point made uh, by Mary, Mary Fee. I, I think the community secretary, I think it's appropriate that the community secretary leads uh, on this work, considering her responsibilities, but I'll be absolutely aligned across government to make sure there is that cohesive focus on the equalities agenda and that the resources are there to support that work. Question 13, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, how much has been raised by the large business supplement since 2016? Minister. The large business supplement has raised a total of £381 million since 2016. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. According to a recent written answer from the Scottish Government, businesses in Scotland have paid £200 million more in rates as a result of the SNP's decision to double the large business supplement in 2016. And figures released today show that there are now 9,000 fewer businesses in Scotland compared to last year. Does the Minister recognise the damage that the SNP's large business supplement is having on Scotland's business base? Minister. I, I don't recognise that at all because Scotland is a, a very competitive place to do business and we're seeking to ensure it's even more competitive than it can be. We are focused on um, supporting small businesses in particular and the small business bonus scheme is significantly more competitive than reliefs for small businesses anywhere else in the UK. The average value of relief received by businesses in Scotland is over £4,500 in 2018-19, while the comparable figure in England is less than 4000 We have also got unique initiatives, uh, as I mentioned to his colleague, in terms of the growth accelerator, which supports businesses which want to grow and improve their premises. And just last week, I announced that I would extend transitional relief to the next revaluation in 2022, capping annual rates increases at 12.5% in real terms for all but the largest ratepayers in the hospitality sector and offices in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. We have a very competitive rates regime. Question 14, Willie Coffey. Thank you. Ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the analysis of the UK budget, which states that the announced changes to tax overwhelmingly benefit the richest households. Cabinet Secretary. My response is, and I, I covered this in some detail last week, that it tells you everything you need to know about the Tory party. Um, of course, in relation to the Labour Party, it's a strange proposition that the Labour Party and the Westminster Parliament is going to copy the Tories tax plan, but for the Scottish Government we've set out the, the key tests and the principles that we'll follow in approaching uh, the income tax uh, discussion. Any change should uh, raise additional revenue to support our public services, protect lower earning taxpayers, make the system more progressive, and when considered alongside our, our spending proposals, support the Scottish economy. That's the key test I set out uh, last year in relation to income tax, and I think there are tests that we will stand by. Willie Coffey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Given almost half of the announced tax cuts will go to the top 10% of households alone, does the Cabinet Secretary not think it's disgraceful that the better off get tax cuts at a time when those in low incomes continue to face hardship? And even more disgraceful that such a move would be supported by the Labour Party. Cabinet Secretary. Right, as I've said, uh, it's strange that the Labour Party are supporting the Tories' tax plans. In Westminster, maybe the branch office in Scotland will propose something different at the, at the budget process as we work our way through it uh, in Scotland. It is true to say, as, as Willie Coffey has done, that on tax, it's the richest in society, it will get the biggest benefits, and it's uh, disproportionately, of course, so for, for, for those at the top end rather than basic rate taxpayers and on, on welfare. Um, they are absolutely continuing to hammering the most vulnerable in society. It really is Robin Hood in reverse that we have from uh, the Tories. And it's an outrageous position at this point in time that even through all this, the UK government is sitting on reserves, £15.4 billion of fiscal headroom they could have used to support the most vulnerable in our society, stimulate uh, the economy and take us more constructively through the difficulties that they've created through their economic mismanagement. Tom Mason. Thank you. Given the Cabinet Secretary's concern for those on lower incomes, will he take this opportunity to welcome the latest rise in the personal allowance, which will benefit the typical basic rate taxpayers by at least £130 a year, and which has since 2010 taken millions of people out of paying in income tax altogether? 
Cabinet Secretary. I think Tom Mason should maybe take a closer look at the whole package of tax cuts that the Tories are, uh, are proposing, and indeed are taking through Westminster. That it is the rich in society, the top decile that benefit the most as a consequence of the income tax changes. And of course I, I support actions that support low uh, income earners. That's exactly what we will do in supporting that, that workforce and, and those income taxpayers through, through our proposals. But no, I cannot welcome the Tory tax plan because it, it gives tax cuts to the richest in society whilst expecting uh, everyone else to carry the burden of austerity. It's not fair, it's not right and it's not progressive. Question 15, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out of the impact of proposals in the UK budget on the lowest fifth of households in Scotland in light of the comment by the Resolution Foundation that it will overwhelmingly benefit richer households. Cabinet Secretary. Well, that is accurate reporting from the Resolution Foundation, whose analysis of the 2018 budget shows that the UK Government tax and benefit policies are strongly regressive. Looking at the overall effect of the UK Government tax and benefit policies put into place since May 2015, they estimate that the poorest fifth of households are expected to be an average of £400 a year worse off, whilst the richest fifth are expected to gain an average £390 a year. Absolutely outrageous. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, while I recognise that uh, universal credit is not something for which the Scottish Government is responsible, will the Cabinet Secretary join me in welcoming the fact that in Scotland people on lower incomes pay less tax than is the case south of the border? And is that something that he hopes and is working to continue into the future? Cabinet Secretary. Well, for a majority of people, Scotland is the lowest tax part of the UK, but we've delivered an income tax policy that's far more progressive, and that's what I would uh, continue to aspire to, a more progressive system of income tax. And of course, in relation to universal credit, the UK government should have stepped back from the appalling implementation of universal credit, which is harming so many people in our society and pushing uh, many families towards uh, food banks. Question 17, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out of what impact uncertainty regarding Brexit is having on business investment decisions. Minister. The Scottish Government's State of the Economy report published in January this year set out analysis on the impact of the uncertainty from Brexit on the Scottish economy, with results showing that the short-term impact is estimated to potentially reduce or defer the level of business investment in Scotland by £1 billion by 2019 to increase the level of unemployment by around 0.8 percentage points by 2019 equivalent to around 21,000 pure jobs in Scotland and lead to lower GDP growth by around 0.3 percentage points cumulatively over 2018-19 equivalent to around £200 per household in Scotland. Furthermore, negative consumer confidence adds another layer of uncertainty which could potentially further weaken the economy. Tom Arthur. I thank the Minister for that answer. In last weekend's Sunday Times, over 70 business leaders, including former chairs of Marks and Spencers, Chain, Stainsbury's and BT, signed a letter calling for a people's vote. And on Monday, compelling polling evidence demonstrated that the entire UK population has turned against Brexit. Does the Minister agree with me? Now is the time for the UK to end government to end its false choice between a bad Brexit and a catastrophic no deal Brexit and commit to remaining in the single market and customs union? Minister. Uh, yes, I do, and I uh, make it clear, the Scottish Government makes it very clear that the outcome for Scotland that makes the most sense, if we're not going to be able to stay in the European Union, is for Scotland, or preferably the UK as a whole, to stay in the single market and the customs union. That is the route that minimises the impact, the damaging impact, the, the uncertainty and economic consequences of Brexit are having on Scotland. Question 18, Graham Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on permanently linking the non-domestic rates poundage to the Consumer Price Index. Minister. We are committed to maintaining a competitive and sustainable taxation environment while delivering sufficient resources to fund the public services upon which we all rely. The Scottish Government will outline the non-domestic rates poundage in the Scottish Government budget on the 12th of December. Graeme Simpson. Thank you for that answer. The the Scottish Retail Consortium has warned that not linking business rates to CPI next year 
would cost businesses £21 million extra. For South and North Lanarkshire alone, it would mean businesses paying about £3.5 million more. So will the Minister commit now to permanently linking rate increases to CPI, as the UK Government has done? Minister. Well, as the member will know, the 2018-19 poundage was capped at CPI, and that was something requested by business and supported by the Barclay Review. But from memory, I don't recall the member voting for that in our budget. So we will continue to listen to business as we develop our draft budget 2019-20 proposals, and we'll confirm the non-domestic rates poundage rate alongside the draft budget, as in previous years. And I look forward to the member supporting whatever is in our draft budget. Question 19, Maurice Corrie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to encourage Post Office Limited in Scotland to offer full banking facilities and services to businesses and private customers in all its branches. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of post offices to consumers, businesses and communities across Scotland. Similar to the banking sector, post offices and postal services are reserved. We've made it clear to both the UK Government and Post Office Limited that they have a responsibility to ensure the availability of existing services are maintained throughout Scotland. We continue to fund Citizens Advice Scotland's research into post office outreach services and how consumers can influence the provision of those outreach services. Maurice Corrie. I thank the Minister for his reply. It is interesting to note that 95% of UK residents live within one mile of a post office. 99% of UK residents live within, 30, within three miles of a post office. With the Allied Irish Bank being the banking partners with the Post Office Limited, according to the uh, Scottish uh, uh, Post Office uh, senior manager here in Scotland, um, it only requires the other 27 banks in the UK United Kingdom's Banking Association to give their approval. Will the Minister now strongly encourage these banks to do so? Minister. Uh, yes, of course. I do uh, reiterate the point that uh, this matter <coughs> is reserved, so we are limited in our ability to directly influence these matters but yes I, I hear uh, Mr Corrie's call uh, and would reiterate it and would encourage uh, for uh, banks to engage with post office network to ensure those services can be supplied. Question 20 James Kelly. Thank you Deputy President Officer to ask the Scottish Government how its forthcoming budget will impact South Lanarkshire Council. Minister. Local authorities, including South Lanarkshire Council, will receive their needs-based formula share of the 2019-20 total local government settlement, which will be announced by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work next month. It will then be for South Lanarkshire Council to allocate the total resources available to them, which will determine the impact on the people of South Lanarkshire. James Kelly. I thank the Minister for that answer. In a, a previous answer, the Cabinet Secretary stated that he would compose his budget based on evidence. Uh, will the Minister and the Finance team give appropriate weight to the evidence published yesterday by COSLA, arguing for a, a fair funding settlement and ensure that councils like South Lanarkshire are not downgraded and penalised as they have done on previous budgets uh, put forward by the Scottish Government? Minister. Well, Causal's case for a fair deal has been noted and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and I ha met uh, Causal just last week in the latest of a series of meetings to discuss next year's local government finance settlement. But this year's finance settlement was uh, a case of treating local authorities fairly despite the cuts to Scotland's resource budget from the UK government. And South Lanarkshire Council received £590 million in funding from the Scottish Government this year. We, just in, we want to ensure that public services are supported and our policy towards local authority spending is to allow local authorities the financial freedom to operate independently. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. Point of order, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I just want to congratulate you on getting through all the 20 questions. I think on, on, no, thank you, Mr. on behalf, Mason. I think, of all the backbenchers across the party. Not a point of order, Mr. Mason. <laughs> and I think you've just put, given me a black spot. Uh, uh, a short pause will remove it. Front benches, please, for the next uh, item of business. <laughs>